In the circles, <clears throat> excuse me, in the circles that I uh, run in amid church leaders and worship leaders, there's a concern that I hear nearly every year. Does it matter that beginning the day after Thanksgiving and then all of December, we hear angels we have heard on high or O come, O come, Emmanuel, in every store we walk into, in every doctor's office that we visit, every time we're calling somebody and we're put on hold? Essentially, we ask, are we desensitized to the significance of these songs because they seem to play on repeat everywhere we go? And sometimes the question varies. And it becomes, when we sing these songs in our services, is it because of sentimentality and nostalgia, because we've always sung them? Or are we really using them for worship as they were intended. And I always respond, who cares? And then I am promptly asked to go away. One of my favorite authors, Brennan Manning, once wrote, once a year, the Christmas season strikes both the sacred and the secular spheres of life with sledgehammer force. Suddenly, Jesus Christ is everywhere. I love Manning's description with sledgehammer force. And I say, hallelujah. I'm a big fan of irony, and it tickles me to no end that during the Christmas season, the presence of Christ is inescapable. Every Christmas season, I'm reminded of Romans 14.11, which says, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. Even the secular world, which is seeking to exploit the holiday for profit, can't esca escape the fact that without Jesus, there is no Christmas. And without the Magi, who we're going to talk about next week, on next Sunday, there would be no gift giving at Christmas. That's pretty cool to me. And as far as music goes, I would much rather hear people rocking out at full volume on Bay to Bay here when they stop outside my office window singing joy to the world than most of what gets played throughout the rest of the year. I love Christmas carols. And I am just so thankful that we have such a talented assembly of musicians to lead us. Thank you again. Can we give them a round of applause again? Thank you. Would you now hear the word of the Lord as it comes to us from the book of Hebrews in the first chapter, the first four verses. Long ago... God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is much more excellent than theirs. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus is why we are here this morning. The advent, literally meaning the arrival, of Jesus altered the trajectory of human history forever. That description of Jesus' titles by the author of Hebrews is quite an introduction. Some of us have letters after our name, right, that list our accomplishments. But none of us have something like heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. 
the reflection of God's glory, the exact imprint of God's very being. One who sustains all things by his powerful word. Jesus is the creator and the owner of all things. One of my preaching heroes, S.M. Lockridge, said it this way. Christ's lordship is based on his ownership. God didn't have to put his signature on the corner of a sunrise. Nobody else is going to cause the sun to rise. He's the owner. God didn't have to put a laundry mark on the lapel of a meadow. He's the owner. God didn't have to carve his initials on the side of a mountain. He's the owner. God didn't have to put a brand on the cattle of a thousand hills. He's the owner. God didn't even have to take out a copyright on the songs that the birds sing He's the owner. Jesus is the reflection of God's glory. And the word glory actually refers to weight. It's akin to one's gravitas, their importance, their reputation, their distinction amongst others. And nothing exceeds God's glory. There just is no comparison. God's glory, the word is doxa in Greek. It's borrowed from the Hebrew word kavad. means a source of life and light. A good way for us to wrap our minds around God's glory is the metaphor of the S-U-N sun in relation to our solar system. It's the sun that makes life possible on this planet. Everything in our solar system revolves around this life-giving, light-giving star. However, if you were to get too close, the sun will incinerate you. The sun's surface is its coldest part, if you can believe it. And that surface still burns at an insane 9,940 degrees Fahrenheit. The sun is 93 million miles away and can still burn you if you stand outside too long. We in Florida are quite familiar with this, right? And we know that if you get within 3 million miles of the sun, just 3 million miles away, anything that gets that close gets incinerated. That sort of radiance is a good metaphor for God's kavod, his holiness, his glory. It is blinding and beautiful, but also dangerous. It is why when Moses encounters the burning bush, God had to warn him, don't come any closer. You're standing on holy ground. Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the exact imprint of the divine. I love that phrasing because it helps us comprehend how Jesus is both co-equal with God and distinct in the Trinity. Jesus is the exact imprint, the avatar, the direct likeness of our Heavenly Father. This is why when Jesus grew up and he was teaching, he said, If you want to know what my Father is like, look at me. Jesus is as close to God as humanity can get. The author of Hebrews says that Jesus sustains all life on the planet. It does seem that if anybody was ever worth their renown or their titles, it's Jesus the Christ. There is a Jewish teaching about the unpronounceable name of God. See, Israel believed that the name of God was so sacred that they didn't even want to pronounce it lest they disparage it in some way. So in order to talk about God, Israel would substitute four unpronounceable consonants. The Hebrew letters Yo, Had, Vu, Had. You may have seen it written in English Y-H-W-H in your Bibles. And this is 
Sometimes in your biblical translation, if you look it up and you see L-O-R-D in all caps, it's a substitution for Y-H-W-H. It's where the divine name is written in English sometimes as Yahweh. And in Jewish Midrash teaching, it's pointed out that the name of the Lord is the sound of human breathing. Yo, heart. Foo, hot. So that everything that breathes does so by saying the name of God. And we die the moment we fail to pronounce his name. That's why in Psalms 156 we read, Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. There is none like Jesus whose human birth we celebrate this morning. It does seem to me anyway, that during the Christmas season, Jesus becomes something of a celebrity, more so than throughout the rest of the year. His image appears everywhere in both secular and Christian spaces. And celebrity, it's a funny thing in our country. It makes people act strangely. You may recall the footage of when the Beatles came to America People lost their minds. Women were screaming and crying and passing out. And they actually had to stop touring in America because it was deemed unsafe for the general public. John Lennon even claimed that the band was more popular than Jesus. Not quite. Jesus is alive. John Lennon is still dead. For those who are younger in the crowd, it's like Taylor Swift or BTS, that kind of reaction. Where they shut down Ticketmaster. Actors, musicians, athletes, British royals. America is so fixated with celebrity. We have people who are famous just for being famous. They've not contributed anything to the culture. They're just well known for being well known. Entire industries have been created and upheld because of our fixation with famous people. It's kind of bizarre, really. And speaking of celebrity and Christmas, a few weeks ago we had chapel with the day school right here, and uh, Santa showed up. And let me tell you about celebrity at Christmas time. These kids were beside themselves, reaching out of the aisles. They couldn't wait to touch Santa. It was so cool. Have you ever met somebody famous? A celebrity? We all have a story, don't we? It's weird. It's weird that just seeing a famous person in public excites most people. I'll be honest, it excites me. Seeing some famous people around town. You used to ask for an autograph. These days it's like, I need a selfie or it didn't happen. Nobody will believe you. And then, that interaction, it makes its way into every conversation you have for the next couple days, doesn't it? We'll find a reason to bring it up. Oh, dinner's delicious. You're never going to believe who I saw. I got a selfie with him. Look. Most of the people that we put on the pedestal of celebrity, they're usually of interest because they've done something music they've made, or a game they play, a film or a show that they've performed in. Maybe we venerate celebrities so much because they do something that we can't do ourselves, or maybe not at least on their level. We imagine maybe that their lives are in some way different or better than ours. In reality, however, all celebrities are just people. No matter what they've accomplished or how much we elevate them, they're just people. So why do you think we don't get as worked up about Jesus as we do other celebrities? Are you as excited to talk about the, the one that we're celebrating the guy whose birthday it is today, Jesus? Are you as excited to talk about Jesus as you would be to recount meeting 
Tom Brady or Tom Hanks. You could stack any celebrity's accomplishments against Jesus's, and it would be an embarrassment for them. You won a Super Bowl? You were in a popular movie? Wow! Creator and owner of all things. Reflection of God's glory. Exact imprint of the divine. I sustain all life on the planet. But good job. That breath you just took, you're welcome. Every celebrity's admirable lifestyle is comprised of stuff that belongs to Jesus. Stuff that he made for himself in the first place. They're just borrowing it. Your favorite celebrity might be a philanthropist, but they have never laid their life on the line for all humanity, including the people who hate him. Man. And what's more is that we know Jesus. We have a personal relationship with him. If you don't, you can. You don't have to catch him wandering around in Publix and ask for a selfie. You just have to say, hey, can we have a relationship? And you can. And we get to talk to him whenever we want. His presence is always with us wherever we go. In fact, that's the singular reason that we're celebrating Christmas in the first place. He is Emmanuel, God with us, always. So this morning, I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. May you enjoy your day of celebration and revelry made possible by Jesus. May we be inspired to get as excited about our Savior as we are about celebrities. And may we raise our voices and declare joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room and heaven and nature sing.